Welcome everyone. Uh, first, I hope everyone is healthy and safe and doing what they need to do to stay that way. My name is Andrea Ray and I have the pleasure to serve as the President CEO at the Chamber. And on behalf of our board and staff, thank you for being with us here tonight. It's an honor to welcome you to our 32nd Government Affairs and Public Officials Reception. As we begin our gathering, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that our event today, although virtual, is taking place on occupied Coast Salish land and the Seattle Southside Chamber is on the homelands of the Duwamish people. We pay respect to the Coast Salish elders past and present and extend that respect to their descendants and to all indigenous people. Thank you. This copyrighted webinar is presented by the Seattle Southside Chamber of Commerce and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of the chamber. A little Zoom housekeeping. I know that we should be used to all of this by now. Uh, and thank you again to everyone for joining us. Uh, this event was scheduled to be in person. Uh, and then due to the COVID pandemic, the increases uh, in cases and transmissibility of the virus, uh, we did move it to be virtual. So again, really appreciate um, you joining us and being so flexible and having to pivot. Um, it is a Zoom event. Uh, we'll be spotlighting the candidates when it's time for them to join their respective panel. And you can help us guide our questions when we launch a few Zoom polls to help us know what issues are top of mind for you. You are also able to turn on closed captions. Just click that CC button at the bottom of your screen and, and select show subtitles. Thank you so much to our sponsors uh, who help make this event possible. Amazon, the Boeing Company, Baker Commodities, and South King Media. Scott and Teresa Schaefer are, have been tireless advocates uh, for our region and for small businesses. And we are so grateful for them and for all of their support. Um, they're recording this event now um, so that those that can't join uh, with us live can watch the event later at their convenience. We also want to thank our presenting sponsor, Amazon. We are so honored that Jared Axelrod from Amazon is here with us today to share a few words. Jared, over to you. Well, thank you, Andrea, and good evening, everybody. I'm Jared Axelrod, and I lead local public policy and external affairs in Washington State for Amazon. Amazon is proud to be one of the uh, presenting sponsors for the Seattle Southside Chamber's 2021 Public Officials and Candidates Night. And, and you said at the beginning, Andrew, this is the 32nd. Um, amazing that this has been going on for so long and hopefully for 32 more years and beyond. Uh, of course, all, we all wish we could be in person, but we're still excited nonetheless uh, to connect and get together with the public officials and candidates in the South Seattle area this evening. Amazon is proud to be the largest private employer in Washington state. We now have more than 80,000 full and part-time jobs in Washington, many of them in Tukwila, SeaTac, and other communities across South King County. And we can continue to hire. As you may have seen, we announced last week that we have plans to hire 125,000 more jobs across the US, including 2,000 right here in the Puget Sound region. These local jobs in fulfillment and transportation offer an average starting pay of more than $18 per hour, sign-on bonuses of more than uh, of up to $3,000, comprehensive benefits that begin on the first day of employment, and access to training programs that make these roles a springboard to a long-term career. And if you're interested in learning more, you could do so at amazon.com slash apply. Now, frequently asked, what does Amazon look for in communities when deciding where to invest or expand? And the thing that I tell them uh, one of the top qualities that we look for is partnership, and specifically partnership with the public officials and policymakers who represent these communities. We want to work with public servants who want to work with us in order to serve our customers, bring economic prosperity to all, and help find solutions to the common challenges that our communities face. This spirit of partnership is also important to help ensure we have a policymaking process that is inclusionary and that everyone has a seat at the table, not just a select few. And so that is why I am so appreciative of the work that Seattle Southside Chamber does in bringing the business community and the public sector together in this spirit of partnership. So Andrea, thank you to you and your team for the work you do on behalf of all South King County communities. 
I also want to particularly uh, acknowledge and express our appreciation for the public officials across the region for your service as well. We know, and those of us who are in this, this field know that it is not an easy job being a public servant, um, but we do need smart, pragmatic, and dedicated public servants in office who want to focus on governing and serving the public and not focus on ideological activism. So to those of you running for office for the first time, thank you. Thank you for your bravery and for putting yourself out there to serve the public. And to those running for re-election, thank you for your willingness to continue serving your communities. With that, I'm looking forward to a fun and engaging evening tonight. So again, thank you all for attending. Thank you for your service uh, and, and look forward to a fun evening this tonight. Thanks, Andrea. Back over to you. Perfect. Thank you again so much, Jared. And, and thank you to Amazon. Again, I just want to welcome everyone. That's our 32nd uh, Government Affairs and Public Officials uh, and Candidates Night, and we're just so thrilled that, that you can be here to join us this evening. Our chamber is a nonprofit business organization that has served the communities of Southwest King County since 1988. We focus on business advancement and creating opportunity in South King County because we know that economic equity and development doesn't just happen. We need to work together, all of us, to raise our tide, and we're proud to do that every day. We were founded on the belief that we are better and stronger together, and it is in that same spirit of collaboration that I welcome you here tonight. A few other items as, as we begin. You'll notice that, that some of our panels are, are full and, and some less so. Uh, back in May, we asked all candidates to save the date for this event. Uh, staff reached out multiple times over the last five months to ensure that all candidates were aware of the event and could participate should they choose. We also offered the opportunity for candidates to complete a questionnaire, uh, which you can also find on our website and we encourage everybody who's watching uh, to go to our website, find the questionnaires to get a little bit more information about, about each candidate. Uh, we believe that it is vital for our community to have time and opportunities to engage and participate in a fair and equitable way with our elected officials and with those running for office, which is why we have always prioritized hosting this nonpartisan event. Some candidates have chosen not to participate tonight. Uh, some were simply unavailable. Um, some have had emergencies that have popped up. Uh, what we are so very grateful for is for you, for those that have made the time to join with us, uh, for those who did take the time to submit the questionnaires, to participate uh, and to engage. Um, and of course, to all of our community members that are joining us. Um, this is a live event and we have done our best uh, to organize and, and frame the timing. Uh, so thank you so much for your understanding as we do our best to stay on track. Uh, we might not have time to get to every question and tackle every issue um, with only around you know, 20 minutes uh, for each panel. I can guarantee you that, that we will not have time to get to every issue that, that matters to you. Um, but we hope that we will get time uh, to tackle the, the top issues and you'll have an opportunity to vote on what those top issues are when we launch our polls. I also want to take a moment uh, just to thank all of our elected officials that made time to be with us here today. Um, there's a list here of everyone who, who is here in attendance. Um, we are so grateful for the partnership. Uh, we are so grateful for the engagement. Um, as Jared said, it takes supreme courage and bravery to serve um, and to be called to that public service. Um, and we salute you all and and we thank you all for your for your bravery and your courage and, and are so grateful that that you are willing to to work on behalf of our community uh here is the agenda uh for tonight um what we're going to be doing uh we will bring up uh the candidates uh, in the following order uh 5 20 uh, we will welcome our tequila city county city council candidates uh, we might start a little early if i can have staff confirm uh, that we have everybody here in attendance uh, we will then move on to SeaTac city council uh, we had uh, saved some time for normandy park city council candidates many of the normandy park city council candidates are running unopposed um, and i do not believe that any of them have confirmed their attendance tonight 
Um, so if we get to that part of the program and we do not have any elected officials from the city of Normandy Park in attendance, uh, we will simply take just a brief intermission so that we can still stay on track uh, with our timing. Uh, we will then go on to Des Moines City Council, Burien City Council, uh, Port of Seattle Commission, King County Council, and then King County Executive. How this will work for every panel um, is that we will launch an interactive poll. And so at the beginning of each panel, a poll will pop up in front of your screen. And as an attendee, you will have an opportunity to pick what local issue is top of mind for you. Um, and then that poll will go away. Um, staff will uh, see which is the, the local issue that, that is the top local issue. Um, I will then uh, start with the icebreakers. Uh, each candidate will have an opportunity to introduce themselves uh, by answering what we hope will be a fun icebreaker question. Uh, they'll have two minutes to respond um, and Preston will be keeping track of timing. Um, Preston, do you want to unmute yourself just really quickly and let candidates know um, that the noise they will hear um, if they have hit their timing? Should have heard a bell. I didn't hear a bell very loud. No. So, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Hmm. Let me try one more time. Okay. Yep. I can hear you then. And then you let me know if I need to be the bell ringer and you can bring the bell over to me. I uh, just can. Did you hear the bell? That last time, but not the first couple of times. Yes. Uh, okay. We're good. Okay, perfect. All right. Thanks, everybody. So that's the noise you'll hear. It's just a very a simple bell. Um, uh, then we will go into a lightning round. Um, those will be just quick, you know, yes or no questions uh, from our government affairs committee. Um, you can choose how you want to respond to those yes or no questions. You can give me some thumbs up. You can give me thumbs down. You can do a big X. Uh, you can use the Facebook reactions, however you want to uh, indicate your support or your opposition uh, for that yes or no lightning round question. Um, about six uh, lightning round questions. Um, then we will go into that local issue. Um, so depending on what is the top issue as voted by the poll, um, we will go into that local issue question. Uh, the candidates will have one minute uh, to respond to that local issue question. Every candidate will answer the same question. If we have time, um, then we will ask questions uh, from the attendees who are here with us this evening. Um, you can ask that question by just typing it into the chat. Um, staff will uh, get me those questions um, and we will do our best, uh, again, time permitting um, to go ahead and, and answer those questions from the audience. Uh, and so with that, I think we're just about ready to get started. Uh, final note, uh, just to remind everyone to please respect our culture of kindness and inclusion. Uh, do not address the candidates. Candidates, please do not address each other. Simply respond to me and the attendees that are here. Uh, any behavior that is disrespectful or disrupted uh, will not be tolerated. I know we even have some um, local classes who are planning to watch uh, this event as part of their civics classwork. And I have complete faith that everyone participating tonight, uh, whether as a candidate or as an attendee, will of course conduct themselves with kindness um, and respect. And so with that, I think we are a little early um, to bring up our Tukwila panel, um, but maybe we do have everybody from Tukwila and we can start a little early and we can go ahead and um, bring um, up that poll. So people have some time to take a look at that poll. So you can see the poll that is up there. Um, we have uh, deduced, you know, what are some of the top local issues that are happening within the city of Tukwila. Um, there's the new 42nd Street Bridge. Uh, there's homelessness and encampments. Uh, there's development in the South Center Business District. Of course, there's COVID business uh, and recovery. And there's the new King County Vaccine Verification Program. Um, so you can continue to go ahead um, and vote. Um, while I know our producer will be bringing up uh, the people that are for that first panel, the Tequila City Council. 
Uh, we will start with introductions um, and asking an icebreaker question. Um, and again, just a reminder, you have two minutes uh, to respond. And the first uh, question is going to go uh, to Tosh, Tosh Sharp. Uh, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Please introduce yourself and let us know what your favorite flavor of ice cream is. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, hello, my name is Tosh Sharp, running for a Tecola City Council position one. My favorite ice cream will be um, uh, chocolate chip. So real simple, chocolate chip, thanks. Perfect, thank you so much, Tosh. Uh, next, I am going to Armin Papian. If you were a superhero, and I'll just pause for a second. Oh, there, we got the timer done, perfect. Armin, if you were a superhero, what superhero would you be? If I was a superhero, oh, so I would, I was first introduced to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Armin Papian. I'm running for Tukula City Council, position number one. And thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, to answer your question, Andrea, if I were a superhero character, I would be a Superman. Uh, it was my childhood uh, movie that I used to watch uh, almost every single day. So <laughs> we'll love to be the Spider-Man. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That is a favorite at our house too. Uh, next, uh, Dennis Martinez. Oops, sorry guys, that's my phone going off. Um, what is your theme song? Mr. Martinez, what is your theme song? Please introduce yourself and answer our icebreaker. Hello, my name is... Hello, my name is Dennis Martinez, and um, I guess my favorite song would be Donald Byrd, Pla uh, Places and Spaces, Jazz. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, next, Thomas McLeod, uh, please introduce yourself and answer our icebreaker question. What's your most listened to song on your playlist? Um, let me ask a clarify. Are the next two minutes mine? They are yours to spend however you would like. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, my name is Tom McLeod. Um, I am running for Tequila City Council position number three. Uh, let me answer the question first, then I'll tell you a little bit more about me. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I have a playlist with a favorite song. Um, I like softer, uh, more jazz type stuff or some older R&B stuff. So it would probably be something from that genre if I were to pick one. Um, uh, I'm running for Tequila City Council re-election. I've been on the council for six years. This is the sixth year. Uh, previous to that, I served for six years on the planning commission. Um, gave me some great exposure to some of the land use needs in our city. And my daytime job is a tax accountant at a CPA office here in Bellevue. So um, I've been one of those that have been dealing with uh, all the changes in tax law and deadlines over the last, last two years during COVID, which really allowed me more experience to learn how to pivot and innovate during a stressful time like COVID has provided us. I feel strong in my experience and exposure to budgeting which I think is important uh, for a councilman uh, since we oversee the budget and our policy makers. So uh, I feel pretty passionate about the work we've done so far on council up till now, but I believe there's more work to do and I'm looking forward to uh, doing that work uh, for four more years. So I would love your support. Um, and I really feel that I'm pro-business and if you check my track record or a chance to talk about it, you'll see that. So Tom McLeod for Tequila City Council position number three. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, Mohammed Abdi, um, you have the opportunity to answer the question and introduce yourself uh, for two minutes. What is your favorite junk food or snack? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Adria, for, you know, and everybody in the chambers uh, for allowing me to be here today. It's an honor and privilege. 
Um, again, my name is Muhammad Abdi, and I'm running for the Tulsa City Council Position 5. Uh, to answer your question, what is my favorite junk food? I'm a chips kind of guy. You know, I, I, I like chips. I think chips goes with just about anything. Uh, so anything hot, honestly, it could be hot Cheeto puffs. It could be Tapatio, any of those things. I think, I don't know. I'm, I'm a big chips guy. So, yeah, that's my favorite junk food. And, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, a little bit about me, I'm, you know, uh, I'm a, a long-time school resident. And, you know, I'm 24 years old you know, run for school city council. So for me, um, you know, I'm trying to give back to the community that raised me, the man I am today. I moved uh, to 12 in 97 when I was an infant. And um, yeah, I just want to just want to give back. And uh, also, you know, hopefully inspire people that, you know, uh, that, hey, you know, even if you're young, you can or should be able to run for office, you know. And uh, yeah, I'm just honored to be here today. And uh, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, and next, uh, Deshaun Quinn, uh, you have two minutes uh, to introduce yourself and speak to all of our attendees today. And of course, answer this icebreaker question. If you were trapped in a sitcom, what sitcom would that be? <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, good evening. My name is Deshaun Quinn. Uh, and I am running for the Tupelo City Council position number seven. Um, I'm committed to public service uh, and policymaking. So if I was trapped in a sitcom, um, I would say Seinfeld uh, because of the many different iterations and experiences um, that I've actually had uh, in my life uh, in some of those episodes. So uh, that would be one I'd be comfortable being trapped in. Fantastic. Appreciate it, Mr. Quinn. I think sometimes uh, in my job, I feel like I'm trapped in Parks and Rec, and sometimes it's the West Wing, and sometimes it's all <laughs> in between. So yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, Seinfeld's a great show. Uh, next, uh, last but not least, of course, we have Jay Stark. Uh, you have two minutes uh, to introduce yourself, to talk to all of our attendees here today, and of course, answer this icebreaker question which is, what is your favorite children's story? Well, thank you for having this and hosting this event, Andrea, and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the chamber. Uh, my name is Jay Stark, for those folks watching. Um, I am running for position number seven for our city council. Um, my favorite children's book is probably gonna be Where the Wild Things Are. Uh, it just brings back great memories uh, from my childhood. And, uh, you know, I still get a kick every time I see the, uh, the monsters, um, you know, uh, on TV and, and uh, in print. But um, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about myself. I'm a 25-year technology entrepreneur, uh, uh, business person. Uh, I currently work for T-Mobile. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm sporting my, uh, my Southside Chamber shirt, my business shirt. I'm very focused on the business community. Um, being from the business world myself, um, my wife is a, a small business owner that we run out of here in Tukwila. We moved uh, here from Seattle about three years ago and um, co-founded a business district uh, down in just over the border in Georgetown, Seattle, which was the Seattle Design District Association, uh, which supports the design community. And um, we've already seen, we moved here three years ago because Seattle was just getting out of control but we've already seen lots of other folks in the design community move to Tukwila with no promotion whatsoever. They just wanted to get away from the, the Seattle politics and, and bad uh, policy. And so we've already seen some of those folks move down here. And I wanna promote uh, Tukwila as the second design center of, of the Seattle area. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting on board and, and promoting uh, small businesses and the design community here in Tukwila. Thank you all. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Everybody's being so good on their time. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Uh, so now we're getting ready to go into the lightning round. Um, so again, those reaction, you know, buttons um, are here. Uh, you can, you know, do a thumbs up if you like something, you know, certainly 
You could do a heart. Um, you can also just do the old fashioned way and, you know, thumbs down or big X if you're, if you're a no, you don't like something. Um, so we're gonna go ahead um, and start that now. Um, there's a six questions. Um, and the first question uh, that we will ask is, do you support housing first as a model to help combat the housing crisis in our region? Again, do you support housing first as a model to help combat the housing crisis in our region? See some reactions there. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. All right. We've got the hang of this. I appreciate it. Uh, next question. If fully funded, do you support safe injection sites as a model to help combat the opioid crisis in our region? Again, if fully funded, do you support safe injection sites as a model to help combat the opioid crisis in our region? Perfect. All right, we've got all of those registered. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do you think economic development is important to the future of Tukwila? Again, do you think economic development is important to the future of Tukwila? Perfect. Thank you. Next question, do you think that current policy does enough to encourage or incentivize development and or redevelopment? Again, do you think current policy does enough to encourage or incentivize development or redevelopment? Perfect, thank you so much. Next question, do you think it's important to fund and support marketing efforts in our region for business advancement, recruitment, and tourism? Again, do you think it's important to fund and support marketing efforts in our region for business advancement, recruitment, and tourism? Okay, thank you. Last lightning round question. Do you or will you include the business community as part of outreach and public engagement when considering policy? Again, do you or will you include the business community as part of outreach and public engagement when considering policy? Perfect. All right. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate that. I know some of these questions are a little hard, yes or no's, uh, but it's good just to get a, a just a temperature check on some of your uh, opinions on some of those issues that are important to our, our members. Um, now we're going to go ahead and go into the lightning round, or, or sorry, the local issue question. And in looking at our poll, um, and if staff want to go ahead and end that poll right now, it looks like uh, homelessness and encampments um, is the top concern uh, for people uh, in the community right now. And so I'm going to ask you a question on homelessness uh, and encampments. And then we will go ahead and go in reverse order. So starting with you, Jay, since you went last, you're gonna go first this time and we'll just go backwards that way. Um, and just a reminder that you'll have one minute to respond uh, to this question. And um, that question is, what role, if any, um, should encampments play in addressing homelessness in Tukwila? Again, what role, if any, should encampments play in addressing homelessness in Tukwila? Yes, thanks. Uh, great question. Um, this is one of the the big reasons why we, my wife and I moved with our business out of Seattle uh, in the Georgetown area. If you guys have been up there, it is, it's awful. Um, the, the decommissioned RVs are parked on the roads. The, the tents that are given out by Seattle City Council to the homeless, where they're, they put the tents up on sidewalks where you can't even use them as sidewalks any longer. Uh, and then the, you know, the, tr the trash and the drugs and the needles uh, and, quite frankly, the crime that comes out of these homeless camps because um, they are um, um, funding their drug habits. So we definitely need to make sure that uh, Tukwila does not go down that same hole 
that Seattle has. In fact, that's why businesses are moving out of Seattle. So we want to make sure that we are a destination that respects private property and public property that allows for safe interaction of, of customers and business owners to get to their businesses without uh, worrying about homeless encampments. Perfect, uh, thank you much. Uh, right on the button there for a minute, appreciate it. Um, next, we will go to you, Deshaun Quinn. Again, the question, what role, if any, should encampments play in addressing homelessness in Tukwila? Uh, they should play uh, no role. Um, you know, we just had a briefing uh, in Tukwila about our process where we provide resources uh, for folks, but we have a firm hand on they cannot uh, be uh, or create encampments in the city of Tukwila. And what needs to happen is also our investment in uh, the mental health professionals. Um, also uh, creating housing options for people. We have multiple resources in the city of Tukwila. And uh, just being fundamental that uh, parks were for play and for community, um, not for encampments. And we have a responsibility to respect the next generation that they have the same experiences that we had when we were younger, having these options, uh, these parks um, uh, for families. And so again, uh, they uh, play um, no, no role. Um, and the community has been pretty clear about it. And we've been consistent with policies, practices, and funding to make sure that those things don't happen, but also to be firm when we have to, because we've looked at resources. Perfect, thank you, appreciate that on time. Um, next, uh, Mohammed Abdi, what role, if any, should encampments play in addressing homelessness in Tukwila? <clears throat> I think they shouldn't take a role. You know, I think uh, for, for, for me, I think that uh, we, we need, kind of like Deshaun said, we need more mental health, you know, uh, resources. We need, you know, more housing options for every resident, you know, and I think that, um, as a as a as a person who's trying to do more research, you know, on this topic, uh, you know, I know that homelessness is not only a big issue just in Tukwila, but it's a big issue in the whole state in general and in Seattle. And so I think that we as people, as human beings, uh, you know, as 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 servants of you know, you know, just in society, we need to do a better job of just being more inclusive to those who are the less fortunate, um, that don't have the opportunities that everybody has. And yeah, you know, uh, we need to have more rehabilitation centers, more mental health services uh, provided for everybody and everybody deserves that equal opportunity. So that's just what I have to say about that. Perfect, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, next, Tom McLeod, uh, what role, if any, should encampments play in addressing homelessness? Thank you. Um, so this is a really big issue, uh, not just for Tukwila regionally. Uh, I'm not in favor of the encampments that can just pitch a tent anywhere, but I think we also have to embrace the reality. I mean, for instance, the hand that disciplines is also going to have to be the hand that loves. And so I think it's really important that we don't uh, encourage, in fact, we discourage, but there are, are certainly boundaries that the, the state mandates that we've got to play within as a city. Um, but I want our parks to be safe. I want our trails to be safe. I don't want people to feel that uh, this, these areas have been overtaken. So I am not in favor of them, but I do think we need a solid plan and a policy that deals with uh, people in that situation, why they're there. I think we need to address the mental health issue that's a part of it, which is something we've done in Tukwila by instituting a mental health uh, component to, our, uh, to work with our law enforcement. So it's a complicated issue, but I certainly don't, I'm not supportive of them. And I believe that uh, we need to make sure these areas are safe for our residents. Perfect, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, next, uh, Dennis Martinez, what role, if any, should encampments play in combating homelessness in Tukwila? Hi, so they shouldn't play any role. And uh, to answer your question, it real blunt is, uh, I, I think I'm the only candidate in Tukwila that lives next to a park. For the last five years, during the fall and winter, I've had, you know, I've had homeless people sleeping in the park on the park benches. 
you know, and I do understand, you know, what's going on. You know, I'm a member of our, the Catholic Church here in Tukwila, and we've had people living in the parking lot there, you know, and it, it, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't help us that we, you know, that we are sympathetic, but what it is a regional, it's a national problem, to be honest with you, you know, uh, you can go anywhere. But I remember back even uh, 13 years ago when we were do doing the deep bore tunnel there, you know, in Seattle, they, they were sleeping on, on, on the sidewalks then and it just acerbated itself. You know, we have to find some solution and it's, you know, unfortunately it's not a, a, a city issue or a county issue. It's a state and a nationwide issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you so much. Armin Papian, same question for you. What role, if any, should encampments play? Yeah, I believe so. We need to be compassionate around people that are experiencing homelessness, but at the same time, encampments are not safe. We should not allow them. They are not safe for the people living inside the encampments and for the people around them, so in, in those same neighborhoods. I think we need to take very unique approaches, for example, housing first, uh, adding mental health facilities, uh, and then also enforcing the code enforcement at the same time. We could do both all at the same time. And this is a regional issue. I really think we need to work together with all the cities across. This is, it's a national issue, issue as I said before. Uh, and, and we need the support of, of King County and all these, all, all these, all these regions to come together. Um, and homelessness is an issue that I personally experienced and have worked around at the University of Washington Tacoma where we provided 130 students with affordable housing and we have seen very positive results where students are graduating on time with zero loans and this is a big investment and I think we should apply similar projects to here for Tacoma for our for the people experiencing homelessness here in Tacoma. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Um, and now, uh, last uh, but not least, uh, Tosh Sharp, your chance to answer the question. Uh, yes, uh, as far as homeless encampments, those are not the solution. I want to start off by saying that uh, homeless people should be treated with dignity and with care. They're humans. So when we as a city and citizens decide to find a solution to that problem, homeless is not going away. So we should find a solution that works for everybody. To me, uh, I would think like long-term care, long-term housing with, with homeless in mind. And they're, since they're not going away, some model like the shag, um, building a building similar to that with staff and resources that folks who are high risk like the homeless can use and lean on. Um, studies have shown that having homeless housed by, by our society is far cheaper than having them on the street. So for me, um, that's the model that I would that I would go to. They're not our enemy. They're just people that need our help and we need to find a, a cost-effective way um, to find a solution to that problem. Thanks. Perfect, thank you so much. And uh, we are right at time. And so unfortunately we don't have time uh, to ask uh, if there are any questions, uh, other questions from the, from the audience, but we will thank all of our Tukwila City Council candidates for joining us uh, this evening. Of course, you're welcome to stay and listen to the other panels um, or you are welcome to drop off. And so um, we will now be unpinning you um, and starting to pin uh, our CTAC candidates. Again, thank you so very much for joining us. Again, I so appreciate your patience as we're navigating all of these things. Um, I will now ask staff to go ahead and pop up that CTAC issue poll um, so that all of our attendees can vote on what is the CTAC issue um, that is top of mind for them. And I see it has been popped up there. Again, citing a second airport, uh, police service contract with King County Sheriff's Office, uh, the impacts of CTAC airport, uh, business recovery or King County vaccine verification. So you have a few more minutes to continue to register your responses uh, while we go into uh, the introductions. Again, just a reminder that you have two minutes uh, to introduce yourself and answer the icebreaker question. You can please feel free to use that full two minutes uh, however you would like to introduce yourself and talk to us about your campaign and your candidacy. Um, the first person um, who will be introducing themselves and answering an icebreaker question uh, is Jake Simpson. Uh, Jake, welcome. What is your favorite flower or plant? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Jake Simpson. I'm running for position two on the SeaTac City Council. Uh, I think my favorite plant, we have a Monstera um, here in our living room. I have a ton of houseplants, actually. I love going to the nursery. Uh, 
my friend actually owns Loves, Buds, and Blooms right there on International Boulevard, and I go there and get house plants from her sometimes. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to talk a little bit about, about why I'm running. Uh, something Jared said at the beginning was that um, Amazon seeks out pragmatic leadership uh, leadership um, and people who are committed to governing over um, idealist. Uh, values. And I, I would imagine that as a union organizer, there aren't many things that Jared and I are ideologically aligned on. But my imagination um, in these situations doesn't always serve me well. I've gone out in the community uh, for the last six months, knocking on doors and meeting with small business owners. And uh, I found that we have a lot more in common when we actually get out and have face-to-face -face conversations. And I think that that's really the key. Um, I think everyone's tired of of partisan bickering. And, and there are so many issues in SeaTac that we can come together on that aren't partisan issues like sidewalks and streetlights and uh, safe streets and, and making sure that our kids have uh, you know great parks to play in and things like that. Those are things that we all want. And uh, that's a big part of why I'm running. I wanna bring this community together. So thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, next, with two minutes to introduce themselves, talk about their candidacy, and answer an icebreaker question is Mr. Stan Toombs. Stan, uh, your question is, what is your dream car? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, the issue of car, you know, I'm driving a 92 Volvo, and that's going to be my car for the next several years, I think. Um, I've been on the council for two uh, consecutive council sessions. I was uh, put on the session by the vote of the council in 2019 and again in 2020. Uh, so I've twice served without being elected, which is an unusual experience. And I suggest that is probably the way to go for all you people that do not like to be uh, going through the election process. Uh, SeaTac is a very unique city. I mean, it's unlike most other cities in our area, and we have a very vulnerable ec economy that has to be addressed in all of our decision making. And it's one of the things that a lot of people don't appreciate, and our council works very hard to have a sustainable city. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next, I uh, want two minutes to introduce themselves, talk about their campaign, and answer an icebreaker is Mohammed Eagle. Um, Hamid, if you were going to sail around the world, what would the name of your boat be? That will be freedom. Yes, and I can imagine sailing in the somewhere in the Pacific, in, in between Australia and New Zealand. Uh, my name is Mohammed Igal. I'm Tennessee Tax City Council position number four. It's not my first time. It was second time. And the reason I'm running is that I believe we need city that put people first. Not business, not building, but people. Because what makes it a beautiful place, exceptional place to live, is the people who live in this city. People who get up five in the morning and go to work. So, I have been walking in the, in, the, in, the, in the neighborhood and people are talking about economic recovery, business, small business, economic recovery, housing, all of those traffic and actually sidewalks. Uh, I know the city is doing a little bit there. So I have to admit that. So that's my agenda. Uh, that's why I'm running. And yeah, and thank you for the opportunity. Fantastic, thank you so much. Again, next person with two minutes to introduce themselves, talk about their campaign and answer an icebreaker will be Clyde Hill. Uh, Clyde, if you could add anyone to Mount Rushmore, who would it be? Oh boy, that's a good one. Um, I would say probably uh, Rosa Parks who played a significant role in trying to bring equity um, and equality uh, to persons of color um, back in the Southwest. Um, she took a position on the bus, which was uh, un unheard of before, and she made a stand. And I think that uh, was one of the opportunities that, that 
continue to, to lead people um, to think about um, equality and treating folks uh, justly. Um, my name is Clyde Hill. I am a longtime, lifetime resident of the South End. Uh, I was born in Seattle because I don't think there was a hospital in Burien at the time or one that would support birthing, but um, I've lived in Burien most of my life. Um, my wife and I uh, raised our children there. Uh, part of uh, the upbringing of our children was to instill that community service is something that um, uh, they owe to their community. And so we raised our kids that way. And I continued uh, volunteering uh, up until uh, I ran for election um, uh, four years ago. And uh, I have been seated on the city council for four years. I think my history shows that I am an independent candidate, independent thinking, um, and I am not distracted by outside um, regional um, influences. Uh, I'm heads down, making our city a continuing better place to live. I've served on the Parks and Recreation Committee where we've um, enhanced our parks and expanded, uh, we are expanding our parks. And also I'm proud that we have been working on the housing action plan to help bring better balance of housing. Those are just a few items. Thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, we have Iris Guzman. Uh, Iris, you have two minutes to answer this question and talk about your campaign. Uh, the question is, what's your favorite breakfast food? So my name is Iris Guzman and my favorite breakfast food is pumpkin pancakes and it's pumpkin season. So this is my favorite season of the year. Um, I am running, I am a school social worker for the Highline Public Schools and I am situated at the SeaTac schools, the secondary schools. And so the, the last few years that I've been working there, I have seen where SeaTac is doing great for our community. And then I've also seen where we can do better. And for me, it's very important, one, to acknowledge that we are on Coast Salish land. And two, that our community has changed over the past couple of decades. And we need to be responsive to those changes, especially to our new residents and our new Americans. American residents. Um, as someone who is a child of immigrant parents, I know what it's like to walk into spaces and communities where I don't always feel welcomed and I don't always feel like I have a seat at the table. And I'd like to change that because it's important to acknowledge that we all come from somewhere, that we are not original inhabitants of this land. And so we need to make sure that as folks arrive from different parts of the world, different parts of the region, even if we're coming from, you know, say Seattle to SeaTac, that we are all working together and that we are bringing our differences as strengths and building upon that and that we're not viewing them as deficits and that we're not continually pointing out um, how long we lived here or how we've contributed in one way or another because there's different ways that people contribute that aren't always tangible or quantifiable, but it does make our region stronger and better. And that's something that I want to make sure that someone like me has a seat at the table so that other folks know that they too can have a voice. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, next, we are going into our lightning round questions. So again, uh, whatever re reaction you would you would like, uh, whether that's good old fashioned thumbs up, whether you want to use the Facebook reactions, whether you want to do thumbs down, uh, it's totally your call. Uh, first question for everyone: Do you support funding for health care and mental health to help keep our communities healthy and safe? Do you support? Funding for healthcare and mental health to help keep our communities healthy and safe. Perfect. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, next question, uh, do you support efforts to develop a second commercial airport to meet our region's future air passenger and cargo demand? Do you support efforts to develop a second commercial airport to meet our region's future air, passenger, and cargo demand. Everybody's registered, perfect. Uh, next question, do you support the port's sustainable airport master plan 
to meet future demand at SeaTac. Do you support the Port Sustainable Airport Master Plan to meet future demand at SeaTac? Next question. Do you think it's important to include broad public outreach and engagement when making policy decisions? Again, do you think it's important to include broad public outreach and engagement when making policy decisions? Next question. Do you think it's important to fund and support marketing efforts in our region for business advancement, recruitment, and tourism? And do you think it's important to support fund marketing efforts uh, for business advancement and recruitment? Perfect, thank you. Last lightning round question. Do you or will you include the business community as part of outreach and public engagement when considering policy? Fantastic, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and now it's time to close our poll and see what is the number one uh, issue that the community wants you to talk about. Um, and in looking at it, it looks like it is police services uh, and the contract with the King County Sheriff's Office. Uh, so again, uh, Ms. Guzman, you will have the opportunity to answer this question first. Uh, you will have one minute to respond. And the question is, the city of SeaTac currently contracts police services with the King County Sheriff's Office. Do you support a continuation of that contractual, contractual relationship uh, or would you like to see something else for policing in the city? So again, one minute, uh, continuation of contract uh, or would you like to see something else? Um, I actually would like to see a continuation of the contract with modifications. I am aware that a big chunk of the budget goes towards that contract. My concern with severing those ties and having, say, a SeaTac police department is that we may or may not have the same type of oversight and relationship out in the community that we need. And so I would be concerned about having our own police department that may not have as broad of reach um, in terms of being able to respond to violent crimes. Um, as a school social worker, though, I would like to see funding go towards not just mental health, but also other types of services so that when we have a nonviolent crisis, instead of using our police resources for that, I'd like trained professionals to go to that. Um, I've had to call non-emergency police for crisis um, events, and it was not helpful the way it probably is meant to be. And so I would like to continue the King County partnership, but with expanding it, adding additional services um, with for crisis. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. I, I think you, I don't think it was hard to hear the bell. And so that's why they, they muted you just there at the, at the very end. But I think we got your, your last sentence and so appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, next uh, question, again, a continuation of contract with uh, King County Sheriff's Office or would you like to see something else? Uh, that goes to you, Mr. Clyde-Hill. Thank you. Um, as far as the uh, police uh, services contract with King County goes, um, it is just good business sense to make uh, take a look at your contracts. We had done this recently with the, uh, the uh, regional fire department, and we ended up saving um, tax dollars for our citizens. We, we retained the same amount of services. So in essence, why the council is looking at that contract at this time is to ensure that our residents and our businesses are getting the best value for the dollars that are spent. And, and therefore, it's not, it's not that King County is, is not serving our needs. We just want to make sure that we are getting the best value. So that's, that's why we're currently looking at that contract. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, next uh, is Mr. Mohammed Eagle, same question. Uh, continue the contract, uh, look at something else. I will terminate King County uh, Sheriff uh, contract and I will expand CTAG Police Department. I will hire local boys and girls who born, grow up in this community, who knows their neighborhood, who can walk, it, walk in the neighborhood and say, hey Mary, in, 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 in the street, I will hire and expand it. Um, I want to say one thing that is very important. 
Some people assume that people of color are anti-police. I love police. I love our firefighters. I respect them. But if you know something that you don't know, it's not something that that you are comfortable. That's human nature. So I want to build a relationship with the community, especially a community of, of color, and hire local boys and girls from those communities so they can serve in their community. I don't think that King of Sheriff um, contract is serving us. I walk around in this city. Uh, there, there is part of the city. Sorry, we had to cut you off there. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I know one minute is really, really hard. And it's, it's hard to, you know, get a lot into the 20 minute panel. It gives hopefully giving everybody a little snapshot. So I appreciate everybody's uh, patience with that. Uh, Mr. Jake Simpson, uh, you have the opportunity to answer this question as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I've sat at a lot of bargaining tables um, over the years and Something that I uh, I appreciate the insight that was provided to us, and I I just want to say that like using public safety and emergency services as a bargaining chip in this community um, feels like a scary decision to me. Um, I fully support continuing the contract with the King County Sheriff's Department um, because I think that we need the resources that the King County Sheriff's Department is able to offer this community, um, and I support a regional approach to uh, the fire service as well, um, uh, because that's what our fire department needs in order to respond to crisis uh, in this community. Um, so thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Jake. Um, and I'm so sorry I went out of order a little bit and uh, passed over you, uh, Stan Toombs. Again, I apologize. Of course, you also have uh, an opportunity to answer the same question. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sure you understand that this is an issue that's going to come before our council. So it would be inappropriate for me to state a final decision that I'm going to take until we've had the opportunity to hear all the information coming in that will be presented by all parties and, and press the evaluations of our professional city staff. We have tremendous amount of support for our King County Sheriff officers that serve SeaTac's Police Department. It's not an issue about whether we support these officers and their uh, administration. It's a question about what policing in SeaTac is going to look like in the future and whether it will continue in the same model it is today or whether there's going to be a different model imposed on SeaTac. And that's the issue that we're going to take a very close look at as well as the costs and the performance outcomes to our citizens. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, and that does conclude uh, the panel for SeaTac City Council. Again, thank you so much to all of our county, our city council candidates who have made the time uh, to be here with us today. Again, please feel free um, to stay on and listen to other city council candidates um, as we bring them up. Um, and again, really appreciate it. So thank you to our producer who is now unpinning um, everyone from the CTAC panel. And I am now just going to ask staff if we do have anyone um, from the city of Normandy Park. Um, and it looks like uh, we do not. Um, so I will ask um, if anyone, um, you know, if you certainly if you want to want to uh, stay on, you're you're welcome to, um, and come back. We'll be back in about uh, ten minutes or so. So again, thank you so much. Uh, brief intermission break. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, funny thing about Monopoly is that it was originally invented as a game to teach people about the dangers of Monopoly uh, corporations and trusts. Uh, way back in the day and then sort of evolved into the game that we see today where getting everything uh, that you can and essentially owning the whole board is of course the goal of the game and therefore monopoly um, but it's just kind of an interesting piece of that what I want to get into as a way of an inter introduction is that uh, I'm running uh, for Des Moines City Council I ran four years ago some of you may remember that and um you know, a lot of the issues have stayed the same. Uh, we are finally moving forward on the marina and that's something that I've always advocated for is that we need to bring the marina into the 21st century, but we also need to focus on downtown. We need to have a comprehensive theme and we need to make sure that it is someplace 
that businesses want to come to develop. The marine is going to help with that a lot, um, but it's not something that just happens naturally. The council has to make that happen. Uh, secondly, is that uh, we really need to focus on keeping the community involved. Um, there's been very limited uh, involvement by the community. And of course, COVID has made it that much harder. Um, but even, you know, when you can come, come home and watch a city council meeting in the convenience of your own home on Zoom, very few people have done it. Uh, and so I want to do whatever we can to try to make that more amenable and more accessible. I think that a lot of the projects that have been done by uh, inviting people to come meet on particular topics, get a presentation and do uh, what they like and what they don't like. That was done with the marina, that can be done with downtown, that was recently done with the parks, I think is a good way to get that kind of input and that's the input we really need. Perfect, uh, thank you so much. So we'll, we'll go a little bit out of order here just so that we can um, get the, Get every, get every get everybody here. So Tad, thank you so much uh, for being here and, and for your flexibility. Again, um, you have two minutes to answer this um, icebreaker question. Um, and your question is, have you ever completed anything on your bucket list? Hi, my name is Tad Dobiak. Uh, yes, I did complete something on my bucket list about 10 years ago when I turned 40, I ran a marathon. Um, I had, since I was a kid, always thought that it would be really cool to run a marathon someday. And I was, uh, I was in really good shape at the time and I thought I wouldn't uh, get too much better shape. So I decided to run a marathon and completed that. And uh, that was really a great sense of accomplishment. A lot of hard work went into that. Um, as far as my campaign, I have, I've been asked to run many, many times over the years, and this year I finally said yes. Um, my focus is to uh, work on business development downtown. Um, I've brought to the city council uh, before about, uh, you know, cohesive look downtown uh, as well with signage. Um, basically, I kind of subscribe to if you build it, they will come. Uh, which is uh, um, if we have the places for people to come and visit, they'll come and visit. Des Moines has some natural beauty that we can take advantage of. And um, I was really heartened to see the uh, the foot ferry uh, trial that we did the uh, this last week. Uh, getting more uh, foot traffic in uh, will help revitalize downtown as well. Uh, my other focus is, of course, public safety. Uh, we have a lot of crime issues in our neighborhoods that I hear my neighbors and other citizens uh, complaining about. Uh, if it's, you know, mail theft, car prowls, car theft, uh, a lot of car thefts in the last couple of months. Uh, I really want to help uh, our police department uh, keep uh, public safety on the uh, forefront. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Um, and now we have uh, Jean. And Jean, I'm so sorry. I'm probably going to mispronounce your name. And you can correct me. Is it Oxiger? Um, and your icebreaker question is, what is your favorite dessert? Oh, geez. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I. No, I don't eat that much dessert, but uh, uh, probably ice cream. So anyway, I'm uh, Gene Oxiger and I'm running for Des Moines City Council position three. Uh, I've been a community activist for 45 years. And the reason I'm running is that our kids are, are our future, but because of the pandemic, our kids have fallen behind socially, academically, and emotionally in ways that could harm their physical and mental health for years or even decades. Um, while the effect is universal, it's uh, uh, in particular our Black and Latinx uh, neighbors are suffering the most significant decline in life expectancy since 19 or since uh, World War II. 
even those not affected by the coronavirus uh, could suffer health problems related to poverty, uh, job loss, eviction, or all of the above. Uh, many kids have gone back to school this fall without having mastered the previous year's uh, curriculum. Some kids have disappeared from school altogether and educators worry that more students will drop out, damaging their future earnings potential. This loss of educational opportunities is not just deprived kids of uh, better career careers, it's also having a damaging impact on their, their lives. And, uh, these are, or their life expectancy. Uh, these are not problems that our uh, schools alone can address. Our city government uh, has traditionally engaged with uh, the school district to provide enriching uh, recreational programs and before and after school supervision uh, to help our kids succeed. Fortunately, we've dropped the ball on that. Um, and that's the one thing I wanna do is make sure that we restore those programs and that our kids have uh, the opportunity to succeed. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, Priscilla Vargas, you have two minutes to introduce yourself and answer this icebreaker question. What is your favorite musical instrument and why? Hmm. Uh, probably my favorite musical instrument is the piano. And why? Uh, it's just, I just love the sound uh, that the piano, you know, brings uh, to my ears. Uh, and uh, it's just, a, it's a wonderful instrument. So it's very versatile with um, any kind of music. You'll probably hear the piano at some point. So piano, I would say. A uh, little background about me as to uh, my uh, reason for running, uh, this is my first campaign for an elected position, uh, and I'm running for uh, the City of Des Moines position three, uh, and uh, I am uh, very excited for the opportunity to be on this, uh, on this candidate evening uh, event. Um, I really am running to improve the quality of life for uh, the residents of Des Moines uh, and to build upon the solid foundation of financial stability of our city uh, government. Uh, I am uh, uh, one that will be uh, very transparent uh, and uh, a consensus builder. Uh, I have over 31 years of experience in the public and private sector for transportation type services. Uh, with um, general public and people with disabilities. So that's my background. Uh, and I also have uh, three years of experience working uh, as a committee member for the um, uh, City of Des Moines Senior Services Advisory Committee. So I, I already have uh, built a, a good foundation uh, at the city level with my uh, experience working with the staff uh, and I also uh, want to really express what my priorities are, uh, which is public safety uh, and certainly the uh, development of the marina, uh, revitalization of downtown and surrounding, surrounding neighborhoods, along with the affordable housing and job creation uh, for a livable wage. So Perfect. Sorry, Priscilla, you got, got you off there, but I think we, we got it. I appreciate it. Um, next, uh, we have uh, Tracy Buxton. Uh, Tracy, you also have two minutes to introduce yourself. Answer this icebreaker question. What is your favorite meal to cook? A favorite meal to cook? Uh, something where you just add hot water. <laughs> Cup of noodles. <laughs> I'm so busy uh, that whatever's easy. Now, I don't personally like cup of noodles, but if you're talking about cooking for other people, uh, serious. Okay, so about me, uh, my platform right now is about the same as it was when I was running the first time, working for a safe green destination community. I feel like on each of those levels, we've made some great strides while I've been in office, and but there is, uh, there are a myriad of things we can still address in all three areas. So I'm very supportive when we're talking about safety. If you don't have safety, you really don't have a community. So I'm in support of policy that protects our residents and in full support of our law enforcement and all of the ideas that they are uh, crafting to address the issues in our community. I'm uh, in full support of 
of what they have going in as far as the green part we have developed some great partnerships along the way in the last few years very supportive of policy that can help create a greener environment and preserve the the environment that we have in our parks and our water our trees and uh, in regard to a, creating a destination community it's already been mentioned but fully supporting our small businesses and the invitation to large businesses and, and uh, corporate activity making our community inviting for developers and of course that our marina development is a very exciting development. I think that's going to set the groundwork for uh, some exciting things in our downtown corridor. So very supportive, small business, large business, creating a destination place for the region. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, Matt Mahoney, two minutes. Uh, introduce yourself, answer your icebreaker question, which is, what fictional place would you like to visit? What fictional place would I like to visit? Um, I would say uh, I'm a big fan of the Lord of the Rings. So probably, what is it, Mid -er Middle Earth or whatever, would be scary and exciting at the same time. Uh, my name is Matt Mahoney. I'm the current deputy mayor of the city of Des Moines. I've uh, definitely enjoyed my first term here as it's finishing up. Uh, a few things about me, I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I have 35 years of business experience and I'm very passionate when I sign up for something. Uh, Harry Steinmetz thinks I clone myself because I'm everywhere all the time. I've never missed a city council meeting, committee meeting and a plethora of local meetings. I also attend a lot of the community events, help with the parade, down at the farmer's market, et cetera. So I'm very engaged through the community and I like to talk to the businesses as well. And I know many of them by their first name and have a relationship with them. And I think I'm accessible. I'm, I'm available everywhere and I'm willing to talk with anybody and debate, discuss and disagree or agree with, with any issue. Uh, I'm committed to the development of the waterfront. That's both at the Marina and Redondo to improve our community. And part of that's going to be a catalyst for the downtown where we make ourselves attractive to developers and I'm committed to that. But I'm also committed up on Pack Highway where we have transit and a light rail station coming in where we've got some great opportunities for affordable housing, great transit opportunities and also business opportunities as well. <clears throat> I'm committed to public safety, um, particularly our police. I think our police are on the forefront of, of what the new policing model is, and they look and push themselves forward. So I'm very proud of that. And as a council, we definitely support them in that regard. I'm also supportive of safe streets, paving, making sure there's paving roads and making sure there's sidewalks where our kids' schools are. And I'm- Oh, sorry, Matt, that was two minutes. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, last Des Moines uh, Council candidate is Solel Lewis. Uh, your icebreaker question is, if you had your own talk show, who would be your first guest? Ooh, my first guest would have to be Maxine Waters. She's a great inspiration for me, so that'd be my first guest for sure. But just to intro on me, my name is Soleil Lewis, and I'm running for City of Des Moines City Council position number seven. I am proudly endorsed by the Washington State Educators Association, Congressman Adam Smith, the 33rd Zone Representative Tina Orwall and Senator Mona Doss, just to name a few. As someone who has lived and reinvested her life into South King County, my experience as an educator on the front line, teaching students in person since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic is relevant to this moment. Teaching while my students and coworkers had not enough PPE equipment to sustain not only themselves, but their students for the full school year. Just imagine, imagine that. A teacher taking her last paycheck to buy face masks for her students. That teacher was me. The people of Des Moines deserve a council member that can advocate for their current 
realities. And I believe that my experiences qualified me as the right person in this time for this city council. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate everyone. I'm going to do some quick lightning rounds now. Again, remember, thumbs up, thumbs down. Any reaction uh, that you would like? Uh, six questions really quickly here. Uh, the current uh, state minimum wage is $13.69 an hour. Uh, do you support a higher minimum wage in your city? Perfect. Thank you all so much for recording your reactions. Um, next question. Uh, do you support a ban on new natural gas connections uh, to new and residential buildings in your city? And Tad, I'm realizing you are, um, you do not have video. So if you could just say yes or no, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next lightning round question. Uh, do you support raising taxes and fees to help make up for budget deficits? No. Uh, the line between true crime and nuisance behavior or disorder is often blurred in public perception. Do you principally agree with the broken window theory that essentially indicates that when a problem goes unintended in a given environment, it can impact attitudes towards that environment and lead to more problems? Yes. Thanks everyone. Do you support raising taxes and fees to help raise money to support more police and other public safety services? Yes. Uh, last lightning round question, do you or will you include the business community as part of outreach and public engagement when considering policy? Yes. Perfect. Great. And we are running a little bit behind, um, so I'm going to try to hurry this up. Um, and we have one uh, issue question we do want everybody to answer. This is one minute to answer the issue question that people most want to hear you talk about, uh, which is marina redevelopment. Um, and for the marina redevelopment question, um, it is, the city has prioritized the marina redevelopment project to encourage investment and economic development. Do you agree with that strategy? Why or why not? And we're going to go in reverse order. Uh, so, Sula Lewis, you were the last uh, for the introductions. And so we will ask that you go first this time around. You have one minute to answer that question. I appreciate all of the positive things that the Marina Redevelopment has done for this community. But after talking to countless voters in Des Moines, I've also heard you know, that some constituents are upset that it's costing too much money. And also when commentary was available, it was too late in a sense. And for citizens in our community to be totally engaged, this city is a city of 31,789 people. It's not a community of 30% who live right down in the marina who we can only receive commentary for those who are the boat owners and specific populations in that 30%, but we forget about those in the 70% in North Hill who are working class families who have two, three jobs, those in Redondo and Zenith. There is an impact into the consideration on how those tax dollars are spent in that 70% density in this city. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you. That was a minute. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, one minute uh, for Matt Mahoney. Uh, Marie, Marina Redevelopment. Um, agree or disagree? Well, oh, I absolutely agree with it. Basically, our towns look like uh, 1962 since 1962. And for the last 25 years, we've talked about developing the marina. We absolutely have to get it done. That is the linchpin that moves us forward to the city everybody's expecting. There will be compromise here and there, but it'll be a great community gathering point for all residents. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Tracy Buxton. Thank you. I'm in full support of marina development. I can't be more excited. I, even though it's not that attractive, I love seeing that crane down there and all the materials moving forward on this project. I think it is the foundation 
of the exciting things that are going to be happening over the next handful of years where our the center of our community can be a gathering place not only for our residents but for uh, people in our region and it will be um, a place where people will come to play recreate enjoy art enjoy each other and invest into the business part of our community i think it's going to be uh, a great opportunity for small business and large to have that marina down there with all of the elements that are being planned to incorporate into that i couldn't be more excited thank you thank you so much uh tad uh doviak uh same question for you uh, okay, I am in support of developing the marina and making that a better uh, front porch for us for people coming across on uh, foot ferries and being a community gathering place. Uh, it's just a stepping stone to uh, developing more of downtown, making that a better place for people to come visit, spend money, and make this a vibrant community uh not just for our citizens but for the entire region uh really money makes the city go and if we have tax dollars coming in from that development then we can do things like pave roads make sidewalks uh work do outreach with uh the community that needs uh our assistance we'll, we'll be able to do all the things that we talk about doing but we just haven't been able to prioritize Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, next, uh, Priscilla Vargas, uh, same question for you. Well, thank you. And this is a great question. I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in moving forward and uh, developing the marina and is one of my top priorities. Uh, I really believe the marina will be an anchor for the city. Um, as some of my colleagues have already mentioned, it's something that will not only uh, improve uh, for the city residents, uh, offering uh, so much more uh, in the way of uh, having opportunity within the city uh, to have a wonderful marina and everything that comes with it, but it will also be a regional asset. Um, and it's going to integrate the water side with the land side and passenger uh, ferry service potentially. So it's all pretty exciting stuff. And again, it opens up more at a regional level, which is what we really want to be because we're all connected. Uh, so again much very much a proponent and um, an advocate for it thank you so much appreciate that uh gene same question i agree on the need for uh development of the marina uh my question or my concern is about how we go about it um there are way too many questions that are are cropping up that we don't have the information uh that we need in order to make intelligent decisions um, we haven't had, one of the big things that people are asking, it doesn't matter, you know, which side you're on, uh, is what are we gonna do about the parking? Uh, we're, we're not getting any kind of information as to uh, the different elements, how they're going to affect the parking down there. And this is the type of thing that we really need to slow down and, you know, take a look at. Uh, we do need to do some action right now. We are in the process of doing some action as far as dealing with the marina slips and all of that, but the rest of the development needs to be uh, you know, better uh, uh, examination. Perfect, thank you. Sorry, we had to mute your last little sentence there. Um, uh, Harry, uh, you are last but not least. Same question, appreciate it. All right, I don't think there's anybody that disagrees uh, that it's time to bring the marina into the 21st century. Uh, it's just been way too long since we had a comprehensive look at making it, it an attractive, as Tad said, front porch to, a, to our, our city. But that's got to be done with an understanding that it needs to be available and accessible to all of people in our city. And I think that there are a number of compromises that are being worked out in order to accomplish that. We will be able to accommodate the small boats so the fisherman that wants to go out for the day but has a smaller boat and doesn't want to have a big slip year round has a place to put his boat and can get that put in the marina. Uh, I think that we need to make sure that there are, uh, you know, uh, basketball courts and play equipment down there for kids and make sure it's still very family friendly. 
it needs to become a reasonable regional asset that is available to all persons. And I think that's where it's headed. And I think that's a good thing. Perfect, thank you so much. And of course, thank you to all of our Des Moines City Council candidates who joined us this evening. We really appreciate you taking the time um, and being with us. So again, thank you. Um, our producer will start to unpin you. Again, you feel free to stay and listen to the other panels. Uh, thank you again. And when we will be bringing up our Burian panel. Um, so again, as we bring up our Burian panel um, and begin to launch our next poll, uh, you can choose what local issue is of top concern to you in Burian. And those issues are crime and public safety, uh, homelessness and encampments, the DESC facility, impacts of SeaTac Airport, COVID business recovery, and King County vaccine verification. So again, everyone, please feel free to continue to vote uh, while we go into our lightning round questions. Again, just a reminder, uh, everyone has two minutes to answer an icebreaker question and also introduce themselves and talk about their campaign. Um, and we will go in order by position and alphabetical, uh, which means that Hugo Garcia, who is running for Burien City Council position number one, will get the opportunity to go first. We'll go ahead and put that two minute timer up there for you, Hugo. Uh, and your question is, if you had to teach a class on one thing, what one thing would that be? Uh, thank you so much for the question. Really uh, humbled and uh, excited to be here in front of the business community here of, of South King County and Buren. Um, I'm running for Buren City Council position one, and I'll quickly answer the question to say that I would love to make sure the class that most impacted my uh, development was um, home ec class, because it taught, home ec taught also how to balance a checkbook for the first time, which was something I was able to share with my own parents, because as an immigrant, that wasn't something that uh, we were used to. So home ec was one of the ones that life skills that are applicable and I definitely would use that. Um, on to myself, I am a very proud product of a small business. I wouldn't even be in this country if it weren't for a small family restaurant that my dad and his cousin operated here near Buren. Uh, for a number of years. So I grew up in a small business environment. I saw the challenges that our, our, our family had as a kid growing up, and it inspired me to get into finance to support small business uh, entrepreneurs and, and dreamers to have access to the American dream and economic development. So I've spent 20 years helping folks uh, uh, access uh, small business capital, whether it's SBA programs, federal programs, loans from small banks. I also work with a nonprofit uh, business developer that did uh, uh, business lending programs and uh, financial planning to communities that don't that lack access to, to finances. Uh, and now, now I also serve uh, uh, King County as an economic development manager uh, where I've served on the front lines of the COVID impact and recovery. Uh, so I'm, I'm super excited to be able to have the opportunity to continue to, to serve and invest in Buren like I have uh, with being your commissioner on business and planning. So thank you for this opportunity. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, next uh, is Jimmy Mata. Jimmy, again, reminder, two minutes to answer the question and introduce yourself. Uh, and your question is, if you could choose two famous people to have dinner with, who would they be? Well, I think it would be Carlos Santana for music and it's two. Two would be the other one. Well, I think it would be uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, let me uh, just introduce myself. My name is Jimmy Mata. Uh, I'm, the mayor, I'm current, currently the mayor of the city of Burien. Um, I, my parents came here, they migrated here from Guatemala. In 1974, I was born in 1975. Uh, so I'm very privileged to have been born in this country of the United States of America. Not only am I privileged to have been born here, but also to serve in a political office uh, where I get to see the challenges and the successes of people. Uh, I currently am seeing the successes of my children. As we all say, we all come from somewhere. And uh, where's the best place in the world but the United States of America? We have flavors from the, around the world. And so I am very pleased to be here. I want to thank the people that have contributed their money 
making sure that this uh, Vietnamese that candidate still continues to exist and the work that South Seattle, uh, South Seattle Chamber of Commerce is doing. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, next candidate to have two minutes to introduce themselves and answer an icebreaker question will be Mark Dorsey. Uh, Mark, if you could be guaranteed one thing in life, what would it be? Oh, without a doubt, happy. I just wanna be happy every day. I wanna be grateful. Um, that's by far uh, what I currently strive for. So if I can have that, I'm good. And uh, yeah, that would feel good. So I uh, just wanna say hi to all of the other candidates. I believe this is the first time that I've had a chance to see and chat with each of you or interact. So hello and congrats. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, especially for all the people that couldn't make it due to the technical difficulties. My name is Mark Dorsey. Uh, I am a resident of Burien for 26 years. Uh, I, my children, I have three children that were uh, born and raised in Burien. They went to Gregory Sierrast Elementary, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, Sylvester, Highline, and also Kennedy. So we did the whole uh, Highline schools. Um, I also coached all of my children's sports teams uh, in Burien for about 14 years. Uh, and that was through all different sports. So that's soccer, baseball, basketball, volleyball. Um, president of the Greg Reese Hearst Swim Club for six years that's in Burien, uh, MC of the St. Francis Auction for many years in Burien. I served on the High Line and SeaTac Meals on Wheels for 12 years. Um, I guess what I'm trying to convey to you is that I am a citizen of Burien. And before I even decided to run, I was invested in Burien. And I have a 26 years of experience uh, in volunteering for my community. I love Burien. Uh, I am running for office because I didn't like the way that the direction of our city is going. Uh, rather than complain about it, I decided to make a change. Uh, so I am uh, I'm excited to jump into the ring and to uh, bring my business acumen, uh, 30 years of founding two companies uh, into city council and to bring some common sense uh, and uh, to, to help make my city better. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, next candidate, uh, again, two minutes, introduce yourself, answer this question is Sarah Moore. Sarah, if you could be any animal in the world, what animal would you be and why? Did you ask that on purpose? Because uh, there's so many animals I would try to be. Um, I would really like to fly though. I've always wanted to fly and I, I would like to be, I think, a, uh, okay, this is gonna sound funny about a turkey vulture. <laughs> because they can soar for so long and just uh, go on a full stomach and, and, and circle around just seeing the world from, from a really high up point of view and, and get some perspective on things. Um, so to kick that off, my name is Sarah Moore and uh, thank you for inviting us to this event. I'm a 19 year resident of Boulevard Park. I live um, in North Burien. I've raised a 19-year-old UW freshman, Noah, here, and also a 31-year-old um, wildlife biologist, Madeline, who is um, here. She returned to Burien after going to a lot of other places and chose this to be her home. My background is in STEM science education. I managed the animal exhibits, during, including the Butterfly House at Pacific Science Center for many years. But my last year has been spent um, very differently managing an isolation and quarantine facility for people exposed to COVID-19 and who do not have a secure place to isolate. I believe these two sets of experiences highlight a lot about myself. Um, I'm focused on logical solutions, excited to share what I know, but I'm also motivated by belief in public service and responsibility. I believe very much that individual action is important and that local governance makes a profound difference in community well being and in people's lives. I'm running because I hope my service can make a positive difference. I give my time to Burien, volunteering overnight in our homeless shelters, sitting on our Parks Commission, co founding and co chairing ACLU Burien People Power. I'm a member of Burien People for Climate Action and co founded Burien White Center Community Support Network. My commitment to Burien is strong. Perfect, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, next candidate, uh, two minutes to introduce yourself and answer this question is Crystal Marks. Uh, Crystal, what is your favorite tradition or holiday? Oh my goodness. Um, 
I used to say Christmas, but um, since I met and married my husband and my kids have grown up, I've really loved seeing their theatrical takes on Halloween. So decorating our house for fall, getting them excited about trick or treating, all of that has been kind of the best thing ever. And Burien's a pretty safe community to do that in. So and by way of an introduction, my name is Crystal Marks. My pronouns are she and her. And I am the current deputy mayor of Burien. Uh, I hold position seven on the Burien City Council. And um, as a six year now Burien resident, um, I could not have been happier at my family's choice to move back here to where my husband spent his formative years going through grades K through 12 in the High Lion School District here in Burien. I'm a mother of four, uh, one child at Hazel Valley, two kiddos over um, in SeaTac and one up in Edmonds because that's just fun. Kids ranging from six to 14 years old. So uh, I am running for re-election for almost the same exact reason that I ran for election four years ago, which uh, centers around public safety. I feel that everyone has the right to feel safe in their community. Uh, and for some people that means uh, safe from crime perpetrated against them um, in their homes. For some it's uh, crime perpetrated against them as they are unfortunately living on the streets. And I think it's our job as a city council to make sure we are also taking care of our business community by making sure that when we see things like uh, home or public safety that needs to be tackled, we're seeing it in a holistic sense, meaning we're seeing every aspect that contributes to public safety for these businesses. I'm really proud to have supported public safety enhancements throughout uh, my last almost four years on council through the, the law enforcement assisted diversion program, supporting the storefront police presence that we have in downtown Burien that will be going into effect in October and uh, a lot more. And I look forward to continue to serving for the next four years. And I'm so grateful to be with you tonight. Fantastic, appreciate it. Thank you so much to all of the candidates. Um, we will now go into our lightning round. Again, feel free to use the Facebook reactions. Feel free to use your own reactions, uh, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, quick questions here. Uh, first one being, do you support using BNO tax to help cover infrastructure improvements? All right, thank you so much. Uh, do you think that your current city policy does enough to support small business? Does uh, your city currently have public parks that could support or accommodate camping or, or overnight parking? If so, do you support the ability to do so without a permit? Overnight parking, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, do you support funding for CTE and career pathway programs to help address our education and workforce needs? Do you think it's important to include broad public outreach and engagement when making policy decisions? And last one, do you or will you include the business community as part of outreach and public engagement uh, when considering policy? Perfect, thank you. And now on to our is issue question. Um, homelessness and encampments um, is the top uh, issue that people want. Um, to hear from you on. Um, and so I will ask that question, uh, which again is what role, if any, should encampments play in addressing homelessness in Burien? Again, what role, if any, should encampments play in addressing homelessness in the city? Um, and we will go reverse order. So Crystal, since you had the opportunity to introduce yourself last, I will now ask you to answer this question first. Uh, and you have one minute. Thank you, uh, candidate uh, Crystal Marks. Thank you. Um, so to start off, <clears throat> excuse me, I am someone who spent over six months of my life experiencing homelessness when I was a child. Um, I was eight years old living in my mother's car under a bridge in Aberdeen, Washington in my friend's houses in their garage sleeping on the floor. So I know what it's like to go through that experience. I think a encampment is a sign of a failure of society as a whole. It is not something that people tend to uh, say, wake up one morning and go, you know, what? I'd really like to develop these issues that lead me to this, uh, this place and to move myself into this situation. 
Um, however, I believe that it does take time to move people from an encampment into services that benefit them and that takes trust and communication with a government that may not have been helpful to them in the past, with a police force that may, they may have seen as adversarial. So I think the role of um, the Burien City Council should be to equip our uh, community service organizations to address these encampments in an ongoing relational manner as opposed to just continuous sweeps that do nothing. Perfect, thank you so much, appreciate that. Uh, Sarah Moore, same question. Thank you, and I wanna start this by centering this fact, when people are housed, we all win. I don't consider encampments to be a solution to homelessness, but a symptom of it. We can all agree that no one should be sleeping outside in Burien, and that's why I support a housing first approach to combating homelessness. Housing first has proven to be the most effective solution to ending chronic homelessness. Um, I don't, however, believe in sweeps of encampments. Sweeping people from place to place is not a long-term or a short-term solution. Regardless of how we feel about it, it simply doesn't work and it harms the people it happens to. Housing First does work. Housing First is the most effective tool we have in our toolbox to address homelessness, including people who are homeless and who also have substance use. Uh, most folks who are unhoused will begin to recover from this um, regardless of the behavioral health issues once they have access to housing. Um, it does take time to do, and I believe that we need solutions to get us there. Thank you. Uh, Mark Dorsey, same question. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, what I support is I support solutions that address specific homeless challenges. And I think that when we get into a habit of throwing around a buzzword of homelessness and, and throwing a solution towards it. But the problem is that uh, being homeless, um, you know, it, it's in a lot of different buckets. We need to identify, you know, exactly what is our homeless situation that we have. And then we need to go after and address each and every single challenge within there. So whether it's drug abuse, whether it's mental health, whether it's somebody that just lost their job, there's a lot of different ways that we need to help them in order to ensure that they succeed. Um, so I think it's really important to dive down into the details of why these specific groups are homeless to begin with, and then provide solutions for each of those demographics. Perfect, thank you so much, appreciate that. Uh, Jimmy Mata, same question for you. Hi, right, well, thank you very much for that question. Now, when we talk about homelessness, you know, we really got to talk about it in a humane way. And you know, we have to make sure that we're bringing everybody to the table. We can talk about what we can do in the future, but let me talk to you about what we're doing here today. In First of all, we knew that we had some gaps in our community. We don't have any housing for children and women in our community. And I want to thank, uh, you know, some of the leadership that we've had in the city. We have Mary's Place that provides housing for children, housing for single women, housing for families. On top of that, we have some housing for women who, for one way or another, need housing. We don't know what their story is, but we have housing for them. Now, let's just talk about DESC, you know, because that's something that's on everybody's mind. You know, people that haven't been there or been involved, because I've been involved, making sure we figure out what do we have in the community. We really don't understand that what we're providing is a life-saving measure. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, and Hugo uh, Garcia, please. Same question. Thank you. Appreciate the question. Uh, as someone who's chaired both your the Buren Small Business Commission and the Planning Commission, I've worked on understanding the dynamics of homelessness and its impacts. And I know that to address it, we need to build homes. Our goal of 144 housing units a year has to be met. And we have to supplement the, the building of homes and multifamily housing that we for years and decades had not looked to invest in with the services that are needed, both job creation services and programs so that people are able to address poverty, are able to, we, we need to get to the root cause of homelessness, lack of opportunity. But at the same time, uh, the state over the last few decades has not invested as much on mental health. And we're seeing regionally our small cities having to now step up and do that. Do that with programs like the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, which is a program that the city has currently started. I wanna make sure we expand on, on systems that provide mental health support, 
job placement support and case management, not just one or two days a week, but evenings, nights, seven days a week. Uh, so it's all about at, uh, addressing it from a multifaceted place, building homes, addressing mental healthness, and no encampments. Perfect. Thank you so much. And again, uh, really appreciate all of the Burien City Council candidates uh, for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, we will begin to unpin you. Again, feel free to stay and, and watch the rest of the panels that we have. Again, just thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and, and your service to the community. So thank you. Um, and we will start to welcome um, our Port of Seattle uh, candidates uh, now. And so we will be pinning uh, our Port of Seattle Commission uh, candidates and welcoming them. Just a reminder, uh, we will be going through um, a couple lightning round questions. You'll have two minutes to answer that and introduce yourself. Um, we'll then um, go into a local issue uh, question. So we will launch that poll um, to see what local issue matters most uh, to the people that are here tonight. Um, so while staff are launching that local issue poll, uh, we will go ahead and get right into introductions uh, and uh, light uh, introductions and the icebreaker question. And we are going to start first uh, with Norman Sigler. And uh, your question is, what book do you love and would recommend that others read? Can you, oh, okay, nice. Uh, what book do I love? Let's see. Um, now I know why the caged bird sings by Maya Angelou. I think anything by Maya Angelou is worth reading but, uh, from all of us. And uh, as someone, you can probably hear the birds in the background who has birds in cages, uh, it's very resonating with me. Uh, I like to think that birds need to be free, uh, but yeah, so that's, the book that I would recommend for folks. Oh, and then about me, uh, my name is Norman Sigler. I'm running for Port of Seattle position number one. I'm running uh, because the port needs bold ideas and uh, bold leadership. I plan to lead with bold actions such as moving to carbon neutrality by 2030 instead of the plan of 2050 because uh, we go toward what we uh, look at. Uh, according to my driving instructor in high school, uh, he would always tell me that the car will go wherever you look. So if we're only looking to 2015 to solve our solutions, 2050, we're not going to get there in time. Um, designating a portion of the port operating budget uh, to eliminate port pollution and designating a percentage of port profits to mitigate environmental injustices in communities impacted by port operations. I moved here in 2003 to be the manager of finance and contracts for the then $55 million engine budget at Alaska Airlines. Uh, this was my third engine, my third engine, my third airline uh, after getting my MBA in finance and accounting from the University of Michigan. Uh, my aviation experience um, includes also working at Delta at, or Northwest Airlines and Continental Airlines. I will bring aviation uh, understanding and background to the commission as I will probably be the only commissioner in about 15 or 20 years to actually have direct aviation experience. Perfect. Sorry, time was up. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, next is uh, Ryan Calkins. Uh, Ryan, your question is, have you ever met your idol or someone you admire greatly? Um, yes, I have. Um, boy, there's been a couple of them. Um, but when I was uh, working in in Latin America immediately after college, I had an opportunity first to work in Central America. And then I moved to Bogota, Colombia, and I worked there for a couple of years. And uh, I, the head of the uh, Colombian Council of Churches, which was the ecumenical group that oversaw where the um, Catholic and Protestant churches worked together, um, was a true hero of mine uh, for his ability to, to collaborate amongst civil society to try to end a, a decades-long civil war in Colombia. And I got a chance to work with him and actually interpret for him uh, for a visiting delegation. So it was truly uh, an incredible day for me to meet him. Um, about me, uh, I, I grew up here in, in the Seattle area. I grew up in Edmonds. My mom is a public school teacher. She continues to substitute occasionally. My dad was a small business owner for my entire life. Uh, 
starting um, a business in uh, the Georgetown neighborhood of Seattle uh, when I was in college, after he had uh, run an earlier business for 20 years that my grandfather had started. They uh, were both important distribution companies that focused on stone and ceramic tile. And that's actually how I got to know the seaport. I worked for my dad. Uh, at eight years old, I was gluing samples to sample boards. And then uh, as a uh, college student, I worked in the warehouse and then came back after I had spent time in Latin America and gone to graduate school to uh, take over the company. And I led the company for 10 years through 2016, and at which point we sold it after getting through the, the Great Recession. And I decided I wanted to get into politics because I had seen that side of things on the Port of Seattle and felt like I could make a difference from uh, the standpoint of a company that had sought out sustainability and its practices and felt like we could bring it to a public agency as well. And so I'm really looking forward to another four years if the voters will, will grant that to me. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, next, Hamdi Mohammed. Uh, two minutes uh, to answer this question and introduce yourself. If you could change places with anyone in the world, who would it be and why? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, you know, I'm channeling Michelle Obama today. When they go low, we go high. And um, when you just asked what book I was looking at becoming, and so maybe I would tra trade places with her and embrace her grace. Um, um, a little bit about myself. I was raised um, by a family of entrepreneurs. My father was a small business truck driver. My mother was a SeaTech airport worker who later started her own small business as a daycare provider. And um, my husband has been a longtime Delta Airlines employee and throughout college, we traveled the world in the name of tourism, uh, thanks to our Delta benefits at that time. Um, I know firsthand how important it is for our business community um, to be centered in the COVID-19 response. Um, I really uh, and truly believe advocating for workers uh, truly needs to coexist with supporting um, small businesses and our economy. Um, currently, I work for King County as a policy advisor. I advise on the county's $12 billion budget and have supported initiatives that invest millions into our small businesses, community organizations, and COVID-19 response. Um, I have the skills, relationships, and expertise in economic development to uh, bring real results for communities in and around the port. And I am looking forward to being a strong partner for our business community um, to advocate uh, for a strong COVID-19 recovery that supports um, the small businesses that have been impacted, um, especially uh, small businesses that are operating at the port and around port communities. Thank you for inviting me today, and I look forward to answering more questions. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Stephanie Bowman, you are next. Two minutes to introduce yourself and answer this icebreaker question. If you were competing in the Olympics, what would your sport of choice be? Oh, that's so easy um, because it's a relatively new sport for the Olympics. I would be competing in windsurfing. Um, I'm a really uh, avid windsurfer down in the Columbia Gorge. So uh, it would be my dream to be able to compete in the Olympics. Unfortunately, I'm nowhere near good enough to do so. Um, but that's a great question. Thank you. Um, the, a little bit about me. It's, um, first of all, great. Thank you. It's so nice to be here with the chamber. Um, I always feel like it's a kind of a homecoming um, time for me when I get to talk with all of you because I am a, a chamber alum. I think some of you on the call tonight know that I used to work for the Seattle chamber many years ago. And um, anybody that's been involved in the chamber knows it truly is a family. And so I love the work that um, the Southside chamber does in particular with helping support the businesses in our South end. Um, I've been on the port commission now for just about six and a half years. And I have to say that I just truly love the port. I love um, what we do. I love the economic opportunity that we provide for the region and for our workers. I am, I call myself sort of a relative newcomer to Seattle. I've only been here 30 years, um, two months and about 10 days. I moved here straight um, from college at the University of Idaho. Um, Seattle was the first, the closest big city to where I went to undergrad and I moved here 
um, just a few months after my father had passed away on my 22nd birthday. Um, it was a big moment in my life to come to a city where I didn't know a single person. Um, I really started from absolute scratch and I've been um, humbled by how many people have embraced me and I've made Seattle and the greater Puget Sound area my home. I got to my start in the port business working for the port of Tacoma, where I worked for six years. And that's really where I developed my love for what we do. And I've been um, just humbled and honored to be able to serve the residents of King County at the port of Seattle and hope to do so again. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Next is Peter Steinbreck. Uh, Two minutes to introduce yourself and answer uh, this icebreaker question. If you could write a book, guaranteed to be a bestseller, what (laughs) would you write about? Oh, I actually have been working on a bit of historical fiction. I love fiction and I also love nonfiction, but the book I'm working on is called The Secret of the Octagon House. And it takes place in 1800, in the year 1800, the year of the founding of the federal city, also known now as Washington, DC. And I won't tell you any more about it. You still have a minute and 30 seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the ice your campaign. Oh, well, I did have more I wanted to tell you about. I'm an architect. I'm running for re-election. I'm a business consultant for over since I was 18. I've been in small business. And I'm running for the port because I support its core mission to promote economic opportunity, jobs, quality jobs, and support environmental sustainability and, is, and do this with an equitable recovery strategy as we uh, fathom the crisis of COVID. As port commissioner, I've worked so hard to create thousands of family wage jobs, dock workers, construction jobs, and more. And I also created a $10 million South King County Community Impact Fund that has funded, excuse me, not thousands, dozens already of important community projects around um, environmental resources and sustainability and uh, economic um, development projects. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, It's working well, and we're talking about extending it for another five years. So during these challenging times, what we need is strong, experienced leadership that I've been providing at the port that delivers. I have a history of civic activism engagement starting with the lessons I learned from my father's activist efforts to save the Pike Place market in 1971, 50 years ago this year, we're celebrating the initiative's overwhelming success. Perfect, thank you. That was time. I appreciate it uh, so much. Uh, And next, uh, Toshiko Hasegawa, uh, it is your turn to have two minutes uh, and answer this icebreaker question. Mm. What is the last best TV show that you watched? The last best. So the, not the last bad one. <laughs> right. Um, TV show, not a movie. Um, I will admit that I actually went down the Down Abbey rabbit hole. That is just it's like political drama in a certain way. Um, and it was actually really well done. <laughs> um, and I really enjoyed it um, until about halfway of, of season two. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Director Ray and everybody at the chamber for hosting this space for all of us to be able to come together. My name is Toshiko Hasegawa. I'm a fourth generation Japanese American whose American story begins with my great grandfather who immigrated through the port of Seattle in search of economic opportunity. We have always lived on Beacon Hill, including on the flight path, um, except for for six years in my 20s, I lived in the city of Burien on uh, 142nd and 6th Avenue Southwest. If I had to shout out my favorite Burien small business, it had to be Rinconcito. You already know, Um, but uh, you know, I am so proud to run for the Port of Seattle because I have seen firsthand the impact the port has on the livability of our communities. I've seen firsthand the potential that it can have and families like mine being able to break into the middle class. Um, And I'm running because 
um, you know, as the director of a state agency, I saw how when COVID hit, businesses and families were hit hardest. And I do believe that there were missed opportunities at the port in order to meaningfully support, in particular, airport concessionaires and disadvantaged business enterprises, CARES Act funds that could have and should have gone to support small businesses, um, making sure that um, we're reducing barriers for contract opportunities. So I'm running to make sure the recovery lifts all ships. Um, and I look forward to a robust conversation. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, now we're going to go into our lightning round. So again, uh, feel free to use whatever reactions you want to indicate your support or opposition uh, to the following questions. Uh, first question, do you believe the port is doing enough to support DBEs and minority contractors? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question, do you believe SeaTech Airport generates economic benefit? for South King County communities. Next question, do you believe SeaTac Airport should continue to grow to meet future demand? Do you believe our region needs a secondary commercial airport? Next question, uh, do you support efforts to develop a second commercial airport to meet our region's future air passenger and cargo demand? And last lightning round question, do you support the port's sustainable airport master plan? Perfect. All right, thank you everyone. Um, and now we're going to go ahead and close the poll to get to our issue question. Um, and it looks like the issue that is on most minds tonight is about airport, or airport noise mitigation. Um, so again, uh, airport noise uh, mitigation is a huge concern for our residents living near or within the flight path of SeaTac Airport. Some noise mitigation investments have been made Others are outdated or in need of an upgrade. What should the role of the port be in providing mitigation for residents and businesses impacted by air traffic noise? And we will again go in reverse order here. Uh, Toshiko Hasegawa, you have the opportunity to answer this question first. Thank you so much, Director Ray. And I think that the port has an opportunity to be a meaningful partner interjurisdictionally, um, in particular with South King County cities that are impacted um, by the airport. It's not just SeaTac, which isn't an agreement and is compensated for some of that impact, but it's also places like Burien, like Tequila, like Des Moines, like Federal Way, um, that all deserve also to be compensated um, for the impact that it has on them. Um, and I would also like to point out, in addition to measurable sound pollution, there is measurable air pollution. Um, I think that it's appropriate that the port allocate resources for schools to receive um, insulation, for schools to receive also uh, air filters to make sure that uh, we're not um, continuing upon the path of um, promoting disparate outcomes for our children. And I also think that for all new construction, how wonderful would it be if that also entailed um, um, insulation so that we can at least in some way be able to mitigate the impact of the experience of living so close to some of that sound and noise impact. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, Peter Steinbrook, same question. Could you please restate the question? I want to be sure to answer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so airport noise mitigation is a huge concern for residents uh, living near or within the flight path of SeaTac Airport. Some noise mitigation investments have been made. Others are outdated or in need of an upgrade. What should the role of the port be in providing mitigation for residents and businesses impacted by air traffic noise? Sure, thank you. And there are multiple issues regarding airport impacts, which again is why I uh, work to create the $10 million community impact fund to support South King County communities that are disproportionately impacted by environmental conditions around the port. There's air pollution, there's noise, and there are there's traffic congestion. And I've been working on all three fronts. I support the work of the Highline Forum 
and the START Roundtable that have produced some very tangible and, produ and, and uh, uh, productive uh, strategies to reduce noise impacts. I believe that the airport and the port have a responsibility to go beyond the minimum requirements of mitigation, despite that the port has already spent hundreds of millions, many people are suffering from the continued increasing air traffic that is causing uh, you know, extreme anxiety and, and health issues regarding noise and, and the air pollution. With regard to noise specifically, we worked, I worked with my colleagues to accelerate the noise abatement program. Sorry, Peter, that time is up. Uh, we've got one, I know it's one minute to answer a very complicated question. I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, patience. Um, Stephanie Bowman, uh, one minute to answer that same question. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so let me just start with saying, I believe that the port over the years has not done anywhere near enough for noise mitigation. When I started on the commission, um, this over the many years, the idea was that the port would apply to the FAA for funds and then do noise mitigation once those funds are received. Um, we have changed that policy under my leadership where we are now accelerating our noise insulation projects and funding those up front and then going back to the FAA um, for reimbursement. But we're not waiting for the FAA anymore. Um, before those things happen. I know this because I also live on the flight path being up in Beacon Hill. It's nowhere near what you experience um, in SeaTac and directly around the airport, but I am very familiar with what it's like to live on the flight path. I'd also say that I'm open to reviewing the former port packages, homes that were insulated, but um, where those packages have failed. And lastly, we need to dramatically increase and keep the tree canopy that we have around um, our SeaTac and um, airport communities. Thank you so much. Uh, Hamdi Mohammed, same question. Thank you for the question. Um, mitigating noise, I will mention a couple of things. De I, it's important for us to develop alternative uh, noise metrics that do not rely on just the FAA computer models that track the sensitivity to noise events. Um, we have to increase the arrival of the gliding scopes to a minimum of three degrees. Um, and change the, the flight tracks um, uh, to ensure that they are meeting the environmental reviews that are already out there. Um, this issue really takes strong regional leadership and advocacy on the federal level. I have both federal and local experience and would be a strong advocate for the South King County community. And I'm proud to say that if elected, I will be the first ever port commissioner from South King County. And so you can count on me to being a strong advocate for the issues that are impacting South King County. And I will also say, while the, the port covers the whole county, we are all better off and we are all better off. When South King County is doing well, the rest of the county is doing well. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Culkin, same question. I feel like I need to be additive here because folks have, have already offered lots of really good insights about the efforts underway and, and the other things that we need to take. And I would say one additional thing that we need to think about is how we change federal legislation around our ability to address these problems. That uh, these are very expensive problems to fix and much of the jurisdiction rests in the hands of agencies like the FAA that the Port of Seattle Commission does not have the power over. And so we need support from our legislators, uh, and, and many thanks go to Congressman Smith, who has been an absolute leader on this on a national level uh, in, in addressing the airport impacts, not just at SeaTac, but at, at airport communities around the country. But at the same time, I think probably everybody on here wants to be able to take that trip with their grandkids to Disneyland or go on that really essential business trip uh, across the country. And it means that we do need to provide consistent and affordable air service to our community. And that's only going to get harder to do as our region grows. And so, you know, in response to those lightning round questions, how do we do it and mitigate impacts for our communities at the same time? Thank you. Uh, and Norman Sigler, same question. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening, uh, one of my platforms is to get the port to carbon neutrality by 2030. And to do that, we definitely need to right size the uh, air traffic coming in and out of SeaTac Airport. Uh, having worked at three airlines and route planning being my first job in the airline business, I really understand how airlines uh, schedule their flights in and out of airports. And we need to right size that air travel to reduce the pollution in addition to noise pollution. Um, 
King County residents give the port annually about $76 million of our uh, tax dollars on a $680 million operating budget. Uh, we can use some of that operating funds to specifically address these issues. Again, another issue in my platform is to set aside operating funds or port profits to mitigate uh, these impacts uh, to the communities that are impacted by noise pollution. I'm currently in Normandy Park at my fiance's home and I hear the airport right now, I can open the door and hear the planes land. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we are at time. So again, it's a lot of information to get into a very short amount of time. Uh, we really appreciate you you being here and letting our constituents just learn a little bit more about you and, and your campaign. So thank you so much to all of our uh, Port of Seattle Commission candidates. Uh, we will start to unpin you and get our King County Council uh, panel up. Again, thank you so much uh, for participating uh, here tonight. Uh, while we bring up our next panel, our candidates for King County Council, uh, we will start to launch our next poll. You can see it there. Um, the issues that matter most to you, please vote. Uh, affordable housing, impacts of SeaTac Airport, uh, COVID business recovery, or the King County Vaccine uh, Verification Program. Again, thank you so much. It's my honor to welcome uh, Dr. Shukri Olo um, and Dave Up the Grove. Uh, you will each have two minutes to answer an icebreaker question, um, as well as talk to us a little bit about your campaign and introduce yourself. Uh, first is going to be Dr. Shukri Olo. Uh, your icebreaker question is to name a class in school that you wish was offered. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you all so much for the opportunity to share more about my candidacy. Uh, and to the chamber, thank you so much for organizing this as well. As an organizer, I know just how much work it takes to plan something like this, especially virtually. So Andrea and team, you are killing it. Um, I would probably want to offer a course on critical race theory. <laughs> my doctoral dissertation was actually on this. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Shukri Olo. Like thousands of residents from South King County, I am a proud refugee. My family and I came to this country after six years of the refugee camp uh, in Kenya after the 1991 Civil War. I grew up right here in South King County in the city of Kent, grew up in public housing, was raised by an incredibly strong Black mother, taking care of three kids by herself. I'm also a mother, a community organizer, a doctoral scholar, and a candidate for King County Council District 5. And because I'm an organizer, our campaign co-designed the platforms with over seven 700 people, including small business owners. My mother is a small business owner and educators and young people. And we have created and co-designed a platform on four key areas, including bending the legal system toward justice, investing in public health and human services, affordable, building more affordable housing and supporting small business. And I'm honored that this message has resonated with countless small business owners, uh, with uh, King County Democrat, the sole endorsement from the SEIU 775-925 and countless community members who believe in the vision that we're creating for this district. And I would be honored to have your support and all the folks watching tonight uh, to make history as the first Black woman elected to King County Council in our state's history. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share more and looking forward to a robust conversation tonight. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, Dave Up the Grove, you have two minutes to introduce yourself and answer this icebreaker question. Please tell us about a movie that you think everyone should watch. A movie everyone should watch. Oh boy. Uh, I'm just going to go with the most recent one I've seen, which was uh, Respect uh, about the story of Aretha Franklin and uh, a powerful movie about, about race, about power, about addiction and, uh, plus some really good music. Um, you know, I think I wanna begin by pointing out that the very first COVID death in the nation was right here in King County. And county public health departments are the front line of defense. And by following the science and supporting our public health professionals, I'm proud that King County has the lowest COVID rate of any major urban county in the continental United States. But those of us in South King County know that it has really shined a light on the disparities 
based on race and income. And that's why I've worked so closely with the community to target resources to our diverse low-income communities in South King County. And as we come out of this pandemic, and we will come out of it, we're facing huge challenges. We need to uh, help homeless individuals get off the street and into housing with support. You know, we need to do a better job addressing public safety. I hear that at the doors every day. And we have an important role to play in trying to get our economy going again to create jobs and economic opportunity. And one thing I know, the solutions to homelessness, public safety and the economy aren't gonna come out of Seattle. They're gonna come from those of us here in South King County working together to solve problems. I love this community. I grew up here attending Gregory Heights Elementary and Sunday School at Lake Berry and Presbyterian. I've loved watching it grow and change. Our diversity is our strength. And I believe all people, regardless of our differences, have value, have something to contribute and deserve equal rights and fair treatment. Those are my core values. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, we will now go into our lightning round. Again, feel free to use whatever reactions you want. Facebook buttons, thumbs up, thumbs down. Yes, no, whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, first question, are county land use regulations and permitting processes doing enough to assure the public interest? Again, are county land use regulations and permitting doing enough? Thank you. Are county investments in unincorporated areas enough to meet the needs of the community? Have infrastructure and transportation improvements received the priority they should in current budgets? Do you support funding for CTE and career pathway programs to help address our education and workforce needs? Do you think it's important to include broad public outreach and engagement when making policy decisions? And do you or will you include the business community as part of outreach and public engagement when considering policy? Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, and our issue that is top of mind for people um, is affordable housing and homelessness uh, programs. And so the question uh, for that is, uh, what would you do differently, if anything, to address the affordable housing crisis, including homelessness, than what has already been done? Again, what would you do differently if anything, to address the affordable housing crisis and homelessness than what has been done recently. You have one minute, and again, we will go in reverse order. Uh, Dave, since you went last, uh, you will now go first. Thank you. You know, I believe housing is a human right, and we have a moral responsibility to help get people off the street and into housing with support. You know, it uh, saves lives. It's the right thing to do. It also saves taxpayer money, hospital costs. Um, we need to implement the bold steps we've taken. We've invested $350 million to purchase uh, existing housing and hotels and long-term care facilities and cities that are willing. What we need to do is work in partnership with our cities and our communities to um, site these uh, facilities. And then I also believe we need to work on converting them into permanent supported housing, um, not just emergency housing. Uh, we need to increase our investments in workforce housing. We need to change our land use laws to allow for more density to incentivize that growth. At the end of the day, this really is a moral question. The American dream is to have a roof over your head and have a home. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Shukriolo, your question next. Thank you so much for the question. You know, I often hear that in politics, it's not personal and it is personal because housing uh, is a personal challenge and a priority for our campaign. And I wanna start with the personal and say that when we talk about affordable housing as a human right, I get it because I've lived it. I grew up six years of my life displaced in a refugee camp. 
I grew up right here in South King County in the city of Kent on a Section 8 voucher. And that was the safety net that my family and I needed to be lifted out of poverty so that I could focus on my education. On the campaign front, we believe that we need deepened tenant protections and rental assistance. Our campaign believes that we need a housing first approach and not just temporary housing, but a pathway to housing, including permanent supportive housing. And finally, we need a pathway to home ownership. I've been in deep and intentional conversations with housing providers in our community and committed to having an environment where people could go from renting to owning right here in District 5. Fantastic. Uh, thank you both so much for making the time to be here with us tonight to talk to us a little bit about your vision uh, for King County and uh, for connecting with the Southside community. Uh, appreciate you making the time. Feel free to stay as we welcome in our next panel, uh, which is the King County Executive Panel. And as our team is bringing up uh, that King County Executive Panel, uh, we will go ahead and also launch our next poll. Um, so that you can help choose uh, what local issue uh, matters most to you. Um, thank you again uh, so much uh, for being here. Uh, and thank you and welcome uh, Dow Constantine and Senator Joe Wynn uh, to the program. Again, we will have two minutes for you to introduce yourself, to answer an icebreaker question and talk to us a little bit about your campaign. We'll they'll go into lightning round questions and then we'll answer that issue question. So again, thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, the first question will go to Dow Constantine. Uh, Mr. Constantine, what was the last time you did something for the first time? Oh, wow, that's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, the first thing I always think about uh, is uh, my kid, I, I get to have a lot of firsts having a first child. Uh, and uh, I got to drop her off at second grade for the first time just uh, a week and a half or so ago. Uh, it's always emotional, but that's probably the first thing. Perfect. And then uh, you have about a minute and 37 seconds just to talk to us a little bit about you. Well, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Dow Constantine, King County Executive. Uh, we are uh, really leading the nation in so many areas, and I'm so proud of the folks that I've brought together in my administration. Uh, first and foremost, in this period of crisis, COVID, we've established a nation-leading record on COVID, taking bold and science-centered action to reduce infections and deaths in our community. And you saw last week, we step forward again uh, with the vaccine mandate to keep people safe, keep our hospitals from being overwhelmed, keep businesses and schools open. Uh, it is not universally popular, but it's the right thing to do. And that has been a consistent theme of my term in office. On homelessness, we've moved forward as was just discussed with our Health Through Housing Initiative, buying hotels all around the county to move people off the streets with the services to stay housed on the environment. Uh, saving our last best places, $9 billion to clean up our waterways and the sound, and a uh, very progressive uh, climate action plan. Uh, and on mobility, today I got to go to the light rail station, the University District that will open uh, on uh, Saturday, a week from now. Uh, we're so proud of the investments that we're making in creating true mobility in our region. I'm really pleased to be endorsed, not just by many progressive organizations, uh, but by people across the county, including the Eastside Business Alliance, Seattle King County Realtors, and the Rental Housing Association. They know I'm a straight shooter who gets the job done. Thank you so much. Uh, Joe Wynn, it's now your opportunity to tell us uh, two minutes, a little bit about yourself and answer this icebreaker question, which is, when you were six years old, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> uh, when I was six years old, I think I just started playing t-ball. So I think I had ambitions of becoming a professional baseball player just because I didn't know uh, what was out there. But the cards weren't in, in it for me and I didn't make it quite there. So played some high school ball and that was about it. But uh, first off, thank you so much for having us here today. I'm Senator Joe Wynn. Uh, I'm the son of refugees born in White Center and raised in Burien, so South King County. My family owned 
a small billiards hall in White Center when I was younger, uh, and then a restaurant uh, when I got a little bit older. And then my sister actually has a small engineering, engineering firm now as well. So I do believe that small business is the backbone of our economy. Also, it's, it's bedtime routines. So you hear kids yelling in the background. It's about that time of the night uh, for all you parents out there. And the reason why I'm running for office is because candidly, I'm impatient. And in the past few months, uh, we've experienced record temperatures, smoke because of wildfires, worsening inequities that have further exacerbated the homelessness crisis, including a failure to distribute hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in rent relief. Uh, I believe we deserve better. We deserve more, and we deserve leaders who will step up and do the work. And this is a pivotal moment uh, that requires bold action and leadership. And we have the opportunity to define the future of our county. And I think the very fact that I'm running for office shows that I'm unafraid of tackling big issues. Uh, we can't wait around for the status quo to solve problems that have been impacting us for decades now. And I think we deserve leaders who will prioritize fixing the root causes of problems. Uh, leaders who come in with executive experience and proven leadership in public office as well. So homelessness, climate change, criminal justice, uh, racial inequities, none of these issues are waiting, so neither am I. And our campaign has already pushed these conversations forward. So imagine what we can do uh, if we were in charge. So first off, right now, thank you for the time. Uh, this is not a moment about politics. This is about getting things done. So I'm excited to be here to talk about solutions with you. And sorry for my, my son in the background. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, next, we're going to go on to some lightning round questions. So again, uh, yes or no, you can thumbs up, you can thumbs down, you can shake your head, you know, however you want. Just let us know uh, support or opposition, yes or no. Uh, do you really want this job? Okay, great. Next question. Uh, do you support creating a leadership model and culture of inclusion? Do you think we're on our way to building back better? Do you support funding for CTE and career pathway programs to help address our education and workforce needs? Do you think it's important to include broad public outreach and engagement when making policy decisions? And do you or will you include the business community as part of outreach and public engagement when considering policy? Awesome, thank you so much, appreciate that. Um, and now taking a look at our issue poll, uh, the number one issue uh, for South King County tonight uh, is again, affordable housing and homelessness programs. Um, and so same question for you as it was for the county council candidates. Um, you'll have one minute to respond. Uh, what would you do um, differently, if anything, um, to address the housing crisis, including homelessness, um, than what has already been done? And since uh, Joe, you were the last uh, to go, you will now go first. Perfect, thank you. And obviously this is a very complex and tough problem, but in terms of addressing homelessness, it is three to five times cheaper to keep somebody housed than it is to take them out of homelessness. So I volunteer at a nonprofit uh, that works on family homelessness. And we found that it is very cost-effective, but also effective in general to keep people housed. I think diversion and turning off the spigot is one of the biggest things that we can do. Also, we need to have a wider breadth of emergency housing options as well. Uh, whether it's tiny homes, whether it's hotels, whether it's non-congregate shelters. The biggest thing for us right now is to ensure that people have a safe place to become stable, to become housed, and that's how they become better as well. And I think that we can be doing more in terms of mobilizing resources in that capacity as well. And also working with our local jurisdictions. Obviously, this is a very tough issue. I know that people have different perspectives on this as well. And one of the things that we could be doing a lot better is engaging our communities to ensure that we have some of these issues worked out as we're moving forward. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Executive Constantine. Well, thank you. Uh, first off, in response to what was said earlier, we have already moved $35 million of rental assistance out, and all of the $128 million we have received this year will have been dispersed in rental assistance by the end of October. 50% uh, of the large landlords have already signed up for our program to advance uh, the rental assistance even prior to the time that they're able to certify. So uh, we are moving ahead of other cities nationwide that have been challenged by the federal rules around rental assistance. But you've heard about Best, uh, Best Starts for Kids. 
uh, our nation leading program. Part of that is helping to keep children and families from becoming unhoused. Uh, and uh, our uh, Health Through Housing initiative, where we are uh, moving people off the streets with the services to stay housed, $350 million to buy facilities, a like amount of money to provide the services to not only house people, get them on their feet and moving forward again towards self-sufficiency. That is the way out of this crisis. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much to Senator Wynn and Executive Constantine for being with us here, um, sharing some of your priorities and platforms for your campaign and your vision for leadership, um, especially how it connects to South King County. We appreciate the time that you took to be here today. Um, and of course, uh, thank you to everyone who came, uh, who participated, who engaged, all of our public officials, all of our candidates. Um, and you, our community members, uh, we are so grateful uh, for the time that you took to be with us here today. Um, thank you to Amazon, thank you to Boeing, thank you to Baker Commodities, uh, Scott and Teresa Schaefer and South King Media. Uh, we are recording this um, so that those who could not join live will still be able to watch the program later at their convenience. Um, again, thank you so much uh, to all of our elected officials and all of our candidates. Um, we really, really appreciate the time that you um, took to be here and of course all of our, our partners. Um, it is as important as ever to come together as a community and learn how we can do our part um, and support our local businesses, keep our economy strong and thriving um, and participating in local elections is one of the most important things uh, that we can do. Um, thank you also for your support to continue to support us. Uh, you can donate directly to support our work. Uh, you can do that at bit.ly slash SSCC support uh, or check out our website for more information. Uh, even a small donation helps us to continue to serve our community. And we are so grateful and deeply appreciate any and all contributions. Uh, please don't forget to check out our calendar for more upcoming events. And thank you to staff as well. Uh, it's, this, was a, this was an undertaking to pull off, I'll just say. And, and thank you for your patience. I know sometimes maybe the timer was a little off as we were trying to switch screens and things. Um, really appreciate your, your patience uh, and your grace um, that you gave us tonight. Uh, thank you, have a great night. Don't forget to vote, appreciate it. <laughs>